Good morning, everyone. I am Abby Elizabeth, and this is the Urban Vessels YouTube channel. This channel is for Christian women, but anyone is welcome to listen. Today, I'd like to address some questions that came to me from a young sister who is seeking to understand how to walk in holiness. Now, there are some differences in the way that men and women walk in holiness and there are different ways that women walk in holiness at different points in their lives all right so the path of a young woman is different than the path of an older woman the path of a married woman is different than that of a widow or a single woman and the, the path of a daughter who is under her father's household is different than the path of a wife. So I, I want to address these things in as simple a way as possible, but I did want to begin with that, that there are some distinctions in a woman's role throughout her life. All right, so we'll begin in the book of Titus, and may God bless the reading of his word. So in Titus chapter 2, we will read about women. And we'll begin with verse 3. It says, The aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh, becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. So this is speaking about the ministry of an older woman. It says the aged women. So these are women whose children are grown. Uh, they may be either married or unmarried. It, it doesn't matter. But usually they have some experience with the role of women. And because of this, they can guide the younger women. And, of course, this scripture is what this particular ministry here on this YouTube channel is based on. That's what I'm doing. I'm an older woman who has some experience with walking as a Christian woman, and therefore, I can help guide the sisters, all right? So, not false accusers here. Now, what, what this is referring to is that women uh, who want to be in a role of guiding younger women, they need to have some qualifications, and one of them is that they're not false accusers. So, they're careful not to be the type of woman who goes around pointing out people's faults and correcting people. Because this is a kind of false accusation in that no one can actually know every motive they have and, and every reason why they might be doing what they're doing. And so as an older woman, if we're guiding younger women, we need to be careful not to to judge the situation not knowing all of the details of it. For example, if a younger woman comes to us and she's having difficulties with her husband, if we're going to advise her in a godly way, we need to be careful not to make accusations up to her or to anyone else about her husband because this would not be helpful we can't know all the details of what goes on in someone else's marriage okay so that's one thing and then it says not given to much wine so of course this is someone who is not indulging their flesh with various addictions okay so a woman who is trying to advise other people needs to be living a godly life herself and not a slave to wine or a slave to overeating or or a slave to various lusts of the flesh okay teachers of good things all right so this is the role in which a woman can teach it's the older woman teaching the younger women and this is very important to notice here that this is not talking about women being pastors and preachers over men, but rather teaching the younger women good things. And now we'll read a little bit further about what these good things are. 
that they may teach the young women to be sober. Okay, this means to be sober in mind, not to be overrun with emotionalism, with fears of different kinds, with, with the kinds of things that tend to sometimes uh, cause younger women to stumble. Okay, being susceptible to uh, things like uh, over, o being overly worried or overly fearful, that, that the older women can guide the younger women in how to be sober. This is not simply talking about not drinking alcohol, although we would surely advise younger women not to drink alcohol. It has more to do with the state of mind of being reasonable and balanced, okay? To love their husbands. So the older women sometimes have a little bit more experience in life, and they understand that it's for a, a younger woman's benefit to advise her to treat her husband with love. And actually, maybe how to go about doing this, how to actually be loving to a husband and to love their children. So it's about, of course, that the older women then teach the younger women how to fulfill their role in the church by being ministers in the family. Now, minister means servant, okay? So when we're talking about men, women ministering to, to anyone, we're talking about service. And that's true of men, too. That's what a, a man is as a minister he's a servant okay it's just that men and women do their service in a different way so the particular service of the younger woman who, who is newly married with young children is to be in service first of all to her husband to be trying to please him to respect him to honor his headship and and to seek his guidance in all things relying on him for both physical and emotional provision, okay? But also for, for her, the young woman to, to care for her own children, okay? And then we read in verse 5, it says to be discreet, okay? Discreet means when we teach younger women to be discreet, we talk to them about how they dress and how they act, okay? So being discreet might include things like modesty, in our clothing. It, it might be in reference to uh, covering one's head, which is a scriptural uh, prescription for, for women to do. And it might also be about how we act in public. So it might be about being quiet in the church, being respectful of one's neighbors, and, and not going around to all the sisters with all one's marital problems, to be discreet in, in their speech, okay? So there's many ways that we as older women teach the younger women discretion, okay? Which is a kind of wisdom, okay? To be discreet, chaste. Now, chastity can refer to virginity. So we, we of course, would, as older women, advise the, the virgins, the, the young maidens, to to be um, careful of their virginity and their chastity. So to dress modestly, to guard this very precious thing that they have and protect it until they're married. But it doesn't only refer to that kind of chastity because chastity implies cleanliness. So a woman who is chaste, first of all, is a, a wife of one husband. So she's loyal and, and sexually faith, faithful to her husband. She's also clean in her speech. So she's careful what she says. She's careful not to speak ill of people. She's careful to speak kindness to people. And she's careful to speak the word of God to people in a respectful way, in God's order. And we're going to get into that a little bit in in just a few moments here, but um, we want to first address these issues in this passage about the younger women. Okay, so 
the older women instruct and teach the younger women to be keepers at home. This means not trying to usurp their husband's role by going out into the workforce. Okay. It also means to be keepers at home and that we don't run around from house to house uh, engaging in, in social activities while leaving our children unsupervised and the housework undone. So a woman who is married, her primary ministry is caring for her husband and her children and the home. So creating an atmosphere of uh, peace and orderliness and cleanliness in the home so that people can have their minds focused on serving God. So it's one way that women serve their family is to care for their home, to create an environment in that home that is orderly and clean and peaceful. Another role for the woman is to prepare and provide healthy and nutritious food for her husband and for her children. And, and this is a time-consuming thing, and, and it's also something that takes a lot of thinking and care being put into it. So a woman who, who loves her family is not going to put food in front of them that might affect their health in a, a negative way. So she's careful to select food that is beneficial for her family. The Ministry of Food in the home, therefore, also includes things like gardening and growing food, preparing the food and shopping for the food, so that people are cared for in this respect. A husband who is out working, whether he is laboring in the fields or if he is laboring for an employer, if he is a blacksmith or a carpenter, it doesn't matter. He is doing those things and therefore he needs his food provided to him so that he has time to, to care for the family's spiritual care. All right. So when the woman provides the meals, uh, the cooking and preparation and gathering of food, that it provides a way, for a support system in a way for the man to be the provider who provides the money and so forth for the home. But it also provides a, a way so that the, the father and the husband, this husband of hers, can then administer the word to the family. So he might come home from work and have food ready for him when he gets home and the children well cared for and behaving well and then he sits down at the table and blesses the food and then conducts a godly conversation with his wife and children over that food. Okay, so in this way the, the wife works together with the husband to provide something spiritually and physically for the entire family. All right? So we go a little bit further here. To be keepers at home. So we, we talked about being a housekeeper, some of the things that that involves. And to be good. What does this mean? To have a good heart and, and to make an effort to to bring goodness to people whether it's uh, of course to the first ministry of the young woman which is to her husband and children but also to be good to the brethren to the household of faith to be good to the poor to be good to the sick and the elderly to be good to widows and the fatherless so a woman has many ways in which she can minister to the body of Christ by her goodness and do so in a way that does not usurp the authority of men, in particular the role of being pastors, preachers, and teachers. So women are not deprived of a ministry and supposed to just sit down and shut up and be barefoot and pregnant in the, Christ in the kitchen as the feminists like to tell stories about, okay? They like to make up a false fable 
in order to make it seem like a godly woman's role prevents her from partaking of a ministry. Okay, women do have a ministry. So we read a little bit further. Keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. Now this is when a woman recognizes and honors her husband's headship over her. And so she is respectful of that. And because she loves him, she wants to please him. So let's use for an example having uh, dinner ready at a certain time. Okay, Her husband might work um, in another town. He might have a long day. He might have even a commute in the car coming home and so when he arrives home he's hungry and tired and he has told his wife that it would be best if she could have food ready about a half an hour after he returns home because he would like to take a shower and clean up and then be able to sit down and enjoy some time with his family all right now a woman who loves her husband is going to be eager to please him in this way. She's going to try to prepare meals that he enjoys. She is also going to try to have the children be in a, a good orderly condition when her husband arrives home from work so that he doesn't come home to chaos, confusion, and upsetness in the home. So she's providing these things for everyone's benefit, including her own. Okay, now I'm going to pause here. We're going to read a little bit further in a minute, but I do want to talk about how a loving Christian wife deals with conflict. And I'm going to use this particular example of when the husband arrives home. Okay, now let's tell a story here. Say the husband has had a particularly difficult day at work, his employer was extremely exacting on him. The people that he dealt with were unhappy and full of complaints and he actually at one point had someone threaten his job. Okay, So he's had a very difficult day at work. On the way home from work he got stuck in traffic. It was raining outside and, and someone almost crashed into his car because they were not paying attention in the rain and did not see properly. And so not only did he have a difficult day at work and a long, uh, grueling trip home, but it almost cost him his car being um, harmed or even himself being harmed. So he's kind of at the end of his tether right now. And he walks into the home, and now the woman has had a somewhat uh, difficult day as well. The children, because it's raining outside, when they uh, were in the house all day, and because of that they have a little bit more energy than they usually do, and, and they're not able to go outside and burn some of that off as healthy, healthy children need to do. So she has that going on, and the dog also has not been out because it's pouring rain, and so the d dog is barking. And also, a sister has come over during the day with a problem in caring for her elderly parents and has been con confiding in the young wife about these difficulties. And she's been ministering to the sister and they've been reading the word of God about how to best handle this other sister's dilemma. So the husband arrives home from work and he sees his wife and her friend sitting at the kitchen table over a cup of tea uh, talking. And he also sees that the children are running around like, like wild animals and there's toys strewn all over the floor. The dog is barking and it even seems that there is no meal prepared. And so he, as we said earlier, has had a bit of a difficult day. And he snaps at his wife. He says, what are you doing? What have you been doing when I have been working hard all day for me to come home to find my home in such a state? Okay. 
Now, the woman has a choice about how she deals with this, okay? Now, the feminist would have her defend herself and to be indignant with her husband and to respond in this way, to say, I have things to do, too. And your dinner will be ready as soon as it's ready. These children have been tormenting me all day in the rain. Why don't you, rather than come home and complain to me, why don't you do something to help out? Okay, now this is the attitude of, of the woman who does not understand her role and the best way to handle these things, okay? So let's give the, the more godly way that a woman can handle this conflict with her husband. First of all, she can look at her husband's condition as one that is caused by the stress of being out in the world, trying to earn a living to support her and their children. Okay, So she can look at him and his uh, slightly irritable condition as uh, with compassion okay and rather than defend herself which seems understandable but it is not going to be helpful if she does this she can respond to him by saying oh my goodness my husband I am so sorry I lost track of the time uh, I will attend to your dinner right away she urges her her friend to depart saying sister you and i will discuss this further in the morning and of course the sister understands and she leaves and then she goes to the children and she says i need you to pick up these toys and put them in your room your father just got home and i need you to quiet down immediately okay your father has had a hard day then she immediately goes to to the stove where of course the dinner was simmering away and she had been working on it while talking with her friend and she she sets the table and begins to go about um, getting the food on the table as her husband has asked her to do in the past okay the husband will react in different ways in response to how the woman handles this stressful situation in the first situation where she defends herself and becomes indignant and accusing of her husband and demanding of her husband, he is going to respond with anger and this is going to provoke an argument. The children will pick up on these upset feelings and their behavior will become worse. The dog will bark louder. The friend will witness this disarray in the home and the dinner that was simmering on the stove as everyone's arguing will slowly burn okay so that's one outcome however if the woman handles it in the second way what will happen is her husband even if he is not a christian will immediately be pricked in his heart when he sees that his, his wife is trying very hard to do her best to please him. And when she behaves in this way, it will become immediately apparent to him that it was not her intention to lollygag through the afternoon, whiling away the afternoon with her friend while neglecting her responsibilities in the home. He will see that without her defending herself. He will also see that sto the stove did have food that was almost ready and that her his wife did indeed lose track of the time. He might then, being convicted in his spirit, decide to help out and take the dog out. And, and, and so he takes the dog out and while he's out there, he reflects on his conversation with his wife and realizes that maybe he was a bit rude, okay? And that he might have even embarrassed her in front of his, uh, in front of her friend. So after walking the dog and spending some time reflecting, and maybe even in prayer, if he's a Christian man, he will go into the home where now the food is is being set upon the table. The children are quiet. 
um, and peace has been restored. And he might slip his arm around his wife's waist and kiss her on the cheek and say, I'm so sorry, honey. You would not believe the day I had. And she would respond then with, oh, honey, I, I know. And why don't you tell me about it? I, I would love to hear. Um, and maybe, you know, we can find a way to make things easier. Okay, that this is the way an older woman would instruct a younger younger woman to handle conflicts with her husband. We can see that there is a a world of difference between the way the the feminist Marxists advise women that they should be, that they should assert themselves and defend themselves and lord it over their husband when he's in a moment of weakness. A Christian woman will see this and see how she can, rather than come from above to judge her husband and argue with her husband, lift him up from underneath. And this not only lifts him up, but it lifts her up, okay? So that was kind of a long side road, so let's go back now to Titus chapter two. And we'll finish with verse 5 here. It says, Obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You see, the, the way women, and, and particularly young women, treat their husbands has a way of it impacting how all of the Christian church is viewed. So when we are in the proper order in our marriages and in our lives, that this is beneficial to the ministry. Okay? So the older women have the ministry of helping to guide the younger women. Okay? Now let's go to the book of Luke chapter 8. And we will begin in verse 2. And certain women, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. Okay, so this is talking about a woman's ministry. And it is not saying at all that these women were disciples in the way that the twelve disciples were, okay, the way that the men were. Because what we read here is that they ministered to Jesus out of their substance. In other words, they provided food, they provided care to Jesus Christ and to the disciples, be it lodging, be it a place to gather and and speak to the disciples, whether it be provisions of physical kindness, if it's washing the feet of, of people coming into the home, if it's providing uh, clean clothing when necessary. Ministering from their substance is not the same thing as being a teacher or a preacher. And, of course, it is a widespread practice in the apostate churches these days to say that this particular passage is referring to women being ministers, using the word minister the way it is used in the modern vernacular. Now, in modern language, what minister means is it means, you know, the fellow who has the fancy robes on who is standing up in the pulpit telling people uh, about what he says is in the Bible, okay? Uh, this is not the way that minister is used in Scripture. Minister means servant. And the way these women served was of their substance, okay? So it's talking about physical provisions for the disciples and for Jesus Christ. So now let's turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and we'll read verse 5. It says, But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered 
dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. Okay, so this is talking about how women cover their heads in when they are praying or prophesying, that this is something that we are commanded to do in Scripture. And this is not talking about her hair. Okay? And we can understand that when we read the next verse. It says, For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. Okay? So this is saying that if her hair is uncovered, let her be shorn. Okay? Obviously, then it is not referring to the hair as being her covering. All right? But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Now, this is another way that women walk in holiness, is to uh, admit and conform to the differences between how men and women wear their hair. It is something that men do to wear short hair and to pray with their heads uncovered. And women are given the, the opposite. Okay, so men and women are different in the way they behave and what is holy for them. It is holy for a woman to have long hair. It is a shame for men to have long hair. It is holy for a man to wear his hair short and it is unholy for a woman to wear her hair short. It is a shame to her. Okay, So both men and women have things that they are told to do with their head. Okay, and The women, women are commanded to cover their heads when they pray or prophesy. And they are also commanded to have long hair. And we read of that in verse we'll read of this situation in verses 14 and onward it says doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair it is a shame unto him but if a woman have long hair it is a glory to her for her hair is given to her for a covering now does this mean that it's given to her for a head covering? No. It means that a woman who has long hair, that this is a kind of modesty for her. And even in the natural, when we look at the difference, and, and let's just take the example of two young women. One woman is dressed, one young woman is dressed very modestly with long hair. And we look at her and we can see that she is graceful and she is covered. We take the same clothing and put it on a young woman with short hair, and that woman immediately seems somewhat more naked to us. It, it uncovers her in a certain way that's hard to prove, but if you look at these two situations, you will understand exactly what I mean. Okay, so the long hair is given to the woman for a covering in, in that it, it is a graceful way for a woman to be, walk in modesty. Okay, A woman is not required to cover her head at all times, only when praying and prophesying. However, it is advisable for a woman to always conduct herself with modesty, knowing that when she is out and about in the world, particularly a young woman, that if her beautiful hair is uncovered, she she is very appealing to men and it it can be distracting from her ministry so if a woman is attempting to speak the gospel in the world and her hair is uncovered and of course praying and prophesying she would cover her hair but if she is saying that she is a christian woman and yet having her hair uncovered in the world it it makes her sexuality and her beauty something that's very enticing. And this can be stumbling a stumbling block not only for those around her, but also for her. Okay? So the, the rule regarding women covering their heads is particularly in application to praying and prophesying. But we also need to dress modestly. And remember that our hair is very 
beautiful and distracting to men and to angels. And this is found also in the scripture. Now let's go to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 22, and we will read verse 5. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. Now, there are parts of the Mosaic law that Christians do not any longer partake of. For example, the various Sabbaths and feasts of, of the Jewish people are not things that the Christian church needs to hold to. And in particular, regarding the Sabbath, that Christians uh, fulfill the law regarding the Sabbath in that they have ceased from their own works and now live their lives unto God, devoted to Jesus Christ. Okay? So they have entered in to the promised rest, and they no longer keep the uh, picture of that, which is the seventh day Sabbath. Rather, they practice the fulfillment of that, which is that they have ceased from their own ways and their own works. Okay? So there are parts about things commanded in the law that do not apply to Christians because we fulfill the law. Okay, so the, the fulfillment of the law is, is something that Christians do, okay? But this particular piece is not something that, that we as Christians walk differently in. It still is God's order regarding men and women because we still live as men and women, and men and women still live in marriages, okay? If they want to be godly people, they are either completely chaste and do not uh, have a, a sexual relationship with anyone, or they are married, okay? And if a, once a woman is married, of course, she is bound to her husband as long as he lives, okay? And we'll get into that in just a minute, but here we're talking about clothing, okay? And God's law regarding clothing has not changed. And it is an abomination unto God when women wear men's clothing. And there are a number of reasons for this. First of all is because it it's um, trying to be something that we're not. Okay. So when a man puts on a skirt, everyone can agree that that man is, is doing something, that he's trying to be something he's not, and that it doesn't. It's not suitable for him. These days, however, it's a little bit more difficult for people to see that when women wear items of clothing that pertain to a man, such as pants, that these are not suitable to them. And there are many reasons why pants are not suitable to women. One is, is that it's not good for their health, and they are susceptible to certain kinds of infections if they wear tight pants, and many women do wear extremely tight pants these days, okay? The other thing that it does is it reveals their nakedness and their sexuality to the whole world, and it's very distracting. When a woman is wearing pants, uh, in particular the kinds of pants that women wear these days, right now, that these things draw attention to her sexuality and her flesh, to the degree that it's almost impossible for anyone to think about anything else other than uh, her sexuality, okay? So these are both reasons why women don't wear pants. And another reason why women don't wear pants is because women need to be in recognition of God's order. And men wear pants. When men wear pants, it does not... Uh, conform to their body in such a way as to distract everyone with their sexuality. It's just merely easier for a man to do the things that men do by wearing pants. Women, the things that women do are actually more difficult when they wear pants. So things that pertain to a woman are her role 
and t wearing the pants is actually usurping the, the role of the man in being uh, in authority and being a worker out in the world, okay? Now, these things are not apparent at all to people who are not born of the Word of God. And I realize that many people are upset when I talk this way. But those who love the Lord really want to please Him. And when they read in His Word that a woman does not put on that which pertaineth to a man, they simply want to please God. And they say, oh, okay, God doesn't want me to wear things that pertain to a man. And of course, I won't do so. All right. I do get people coming to, to me and saying that the things that I say on this channel are beneficial for men and that I should not adhere to what the Bible says about women teaching and that I should open up the discussion as if I were teaching men. And of course, I can't do this as a Christian woman. It is wrong for a Christian woman to teach men about how to be a disciple, to teach men about how to serve God. Okay, And it's usurping the authority over the man that is the reason why this is incorrect. And the the relationship of men and women, the right relationship, is that the woman's role pictures the devotion of the church to Jesus Christ. Now, the church does not teach Jesus, right? And in that way, women do not teach men. So I hope that that part is clear. But when we are ministers as women, say we have a, uh, a ministry where Say our children are uh, grown up, and now we have a, minister, a ministry to the younger women and to the widows, to the fatherless, and to the poor. Okay? Do we then uh, take that opportunity to start preaching and teaching in the world to men? Well, there are some distinctions here that we want to talk about. When a woman is out and about in the world, she does not forbid herself to speak the gospel with her head covered in a respectful way to a man. Okay? Because to do so, maybe that man will not have another opportunity to hear the gospel. So if that woman does not speak it to him, then he might die in his sins and end up in eternal fire. All right? So she is responsible to, to minister with grace but that grace includes staying in the proper order okay so with her head covered and with a meek and quiet spirit presenting the gospel but not and I repeat not then telling him how to be a disciple should that man hear the gospel and want to obey it she can then hand that over either to her husband or to someone who's in leadership, who's a man in the church, who can then take over instructing that young disciple, that young male disciple, in how to be an obedient man. Okay, So we as women need to be careful about our ministry not to take authority over men. All right? So we do have the opportunity, though, to serve in many ways. We can open our homes so that Christians can gather. Okay, We can provide food and shelter to traveling ministers of the word. Okay, That's another thing we can do. We can provide physical care and comfort to, to men who are in the ministry who might be sick or who might even have suffered persecution so they might be injured okay so we might administer uh, healing care to these men who have been injured we have a ministry in helping the younger women uh, who are widows with young children so the widows and the fathers these young women are particularly vulnerable and in need of many things so a woman can have a ministry in that respect she can also be very good to the poor and minister to the poor 
from her substance, okay? Providing them food, providing them clothing, and, and providing them, of course, the gospel. And if they are interested in that, then she can, if they're men, hand that over to a man of God to handle. A woman should not be going around um, acting like a prophet or a teacher or apostle or evangelist over men. She should not be standing on the street corner, Bible in hand, telling the whole world to repent. Because when she does this, she's telling the whole world, including 50% of the, these whole world people being men, and this is outside of order. Okay, so there are things that a woman can do and a, a woman can't do. Another thing is she should be cautious when speaking to men. She should always be respectful of what he's doing and not interrupt his work uh, in order to tell him he needs the gospel and start preaching to him because this is also outside of God's order. When she deals with men, she should always be respectful and honoring of them as men, whether or not they're godly men doesn't matter, okay? So we need to use wisdom and discretion in our ministries. These are ways that women walk in holiness. So I'm going to just briefly review here. We are in subjection to our own husbands. If we don't have a husband, <clears throat> pardon me, we are respectful to all men, but we, our headship is Jesus Christ, so we do what Jesus says. And we honor him in the same way that we would honor our husbands, okay? So we dress modestly. We cover our heads when we pray and prophesy. And our service in the body of Christ has to do with ministering from our substance, okay? So there are many, and we can also open our homes and provide a comfortable place for other um, disciples to gather and to share the word of God. We do not usurp authority over men and take the role of men. We don't wear the clothing of men. We don't interfere in marriages. We don't gossip. We don't bear tales about other people. We are respectful and holy in our conversation, always seeking that on our lips be the word of the Lord, and in our hearts be the heart of the Lord. So a sister can manifest the love of Jesus Christ in the way that she brings comfort to people and compassion to people. But her primary responsibility, especially the younger woman, is to have this ministry to their husband. So they provide compassionate, loving service to their husband. They are an intelligent and thoughtful companion to him. They are ministers over the children and guiding the children in the ways of the Lord, always in the proper order. So this is how a, a woman practices godliness. I hope this message has been a blessing to you. Feel free to email me with further questions. And please know that the comment section, all comments for this video, what are subject to approval just to um, uh, prevent people from embarrassing themselves and, and um, bringing themselves into condemnation before God by saying that God's word doesn't actually say what it says, okay, or by calling me names, all right. These kinds of behaviors are, are not tolerated on this channel. This is a Christian channel, and people are expected to respect each other, but they're also expected to um, hold to the truth of God's word. If you want to tell me that the Bible doesn't say what it says, your comment will not be posted. All right. So my prayers are with you all, and thank you for taking the time to sh to share with me the things that I've um, read to you today from the Scripture about how a godly woman walks in holiness.